channel everybody uh, i'm a little under the weather today but <clears throat> hopefully i can get through this recording because you guys have been asking for it databricks explained <clears throat> and in my opinion databricks will be a major force to be reckoned with uh, in the future here uh, you can't really understand databricks unless you understand the origins of databricks um, this started out of a research project out of berkeley labs back in 2009 uh, originally with the creation of Apache Spark. And Apache Spark is a really powerful tool that lets us analyze like massive amounts of data, right? Like don't think about your ro you know, your little database with billions of rows in it. We're talking about, you know, terabytes upon terabytes of data. Um, and it's an amazing tool. I've used it. Uh, I find it really easy and intuitive to understand. I, I did a lot of programming or I did some programming back in the day in Scala. And we were able to incorporate uh, Spark into that for some of our uh, ML pipelines that we were doing. And um, I find, I just, I really like the concepts. I like their data frames concept. I like the way we can use SQL. I like a, uh, a lot of the features that Spark enables. And it has a pretty, we'll, we'll get into it later, but it has um, quite a big following in the developer community. Uh, they have a serious, like heavyweight talent, dude. Like to really understand how amazing these people are, you, you really need to do some research. Uh, but these people created Spark, Delta Lake, and ML Flow, dude. Like these are three massively popular open source tools you to use to build ML and AI software generally. And these guys are incredible. Right? <laughs> so like, dude, you want to understand how how talent packed Databricks is? You really got to um, dig into their co-founders and. Um, the value that these people have built for the software community generally. Um, so yeah, huge props to the team there. Um, let's get into the product features that I personally like the most. If you want to read about all their product features, go onto their website. Um, but the ones that I really like a lot is this data lake built on top of the Delta format. The Delta format does a, a lot of things really well. Uh, one of the things it does well is streaming because it has acid guarantees and you can know that you're, you're not going to fuck up your own data, right? So like the other thing it does incredibly well is it man manages incremental updates without the need to go and repair all your tables every time you get uh, new updates for the day. So this is really, really cool and it's a major pain on other platforms. And uh, when they came out with Delta, I think it was 2018 and they generally released it, I think it was right around that time. I was like pumped when I saw the solution. So really cool um, their managed ml flows their ml ops layer with ml flow is incredible ml flow in general is incredible great tool um, and i really like it uh, their ai and ml libraries you know a lot of people don't know that they have their own but they do have their own ml and ai libraries that are really useful for for people engaging in data science um, their polyglot notebook support is top notch you can basically program in anything in there if you're an r studio user you're going to find their platform uh, you know, you can integrate in there. Um, the streaming is incredible. Uh, so this is something that's actually really, really difficult to do right. It's, it's really sounds super easy when you read the documentation from Kafka or you're reading Snowpipe documentation, but streaming done correctly is actually really hard because you have to deal with some pretty massive challenges, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit, but it also runs on any, you know, any major cloud provider. Uh, but to me, the, these, Features that I'm referencing here are the ones that were most exciting to me as a developer when I was looking at the platform. Uh, the key differentiators, talent, 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 man. They've got an amazing talent pool uh, and group of co-founders. Um, they, they're superior streaming, so let's get into this a little bit. They do three things really well, windowing, late arrival data, and acid compliance. And these are three things that will kill your data streaming if you, do, if you don't address them and do them wrong. Um, and windowing, you know, just has to deal with... Um, a lot of time series aggregation typically and how we aggregate the data and dealing with high water marks. Late arrival data is a total pain in the butt. You would think data would come in at the time it was streamed, but that's not always the case because devices go offline, especially if you're doing like location tracking on a cell phone and you'll get events that come through, you know, from the past month and you're just like, what is this doing to my stream? But they have a way for you to handle that. I think the farthest back they can go, it really depends on memory. And I think it's recommended seven days or something. But that generally works out pretty well. Um, and again, they have their asset compliant. Um, so again, you get the guarantees you need to know you're not going to F up your own data. Uh, Delta, again, huge differentiator. That's a, an, an open source format they created. 
But they always save the best flavor of the open source versions of these things for themselves. They're more performant and they have more features when you're using the professional platform. And also that's the same with Spark. They have a way more performant version that they reserve for their, prof their paid customers. Their enterprise support is top notch. They're, they do have a really good training uh, and support service that's already mature. Um, and they have a thriving developer community, right? So they're, they are building the open source tech that developers already love to use, right? So their streaming is, again, unmatched. And why is that important? Because they've figured out that like in the modern sort of ML AI space, you, both, you need both continuous ingestion of data and you need ETLs to process your data later in the day. And they've built it all around a concept that's unified under the thing that everyone always forgets is that you really need data going to, it goes from raw to ready. So like when you see this ingestion tables, let's just consider that um, the first pass through of the raw data coming in. And you don't use that for science. And then the refined tables are generally enriched data, data that um, we can decide how good or bad it is by enriching it with other sets of data and running it through algorithms we've built to determine if it's quality. That'll be like our, our, our um, silver tables. And then we'll go over to our, the feature tables that in the gold layer or the gold standard where they're actually used in um, data science and are aggregated and ready for use and governed and all of that great stuff. And so their streaming, uh, being able to contribute to this and their concepts around going from raw to ready and they're built into their data lake is um, huge in my opinion. Um, challenges and challengers, right? Well, we, if you watch this channel, it shouldn't be a surprise. So Snowflake for sure, Palantir for sure, and then all of the various cloud providers uh, you know, who eventually I think are going to end up open sourcing their competing products um, and, and just stop maintaining them because no one's going to want to use them. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, yeah, definitely going to be competing head to head with these companies for sure. Um, this is not cheap, by the way. Like I got a quote in 2018. I can't tell you the exact numbers, but let's just say it's between it was between 50 and 100 K when you included the support costs, which you absolutely need. You know, um, you're not going to purchase a product like this and not purchase support unless you're stupid. Uh, so, so it's not cheap and it's definitely comparable to a foundry pricing model, in my opinion. Uh, data science is hard to staff. So this is the thing we're going to get into here in a second, but like it's, you can't just hire data scientists and ML ops engineers and, and people who do data engineering. These are like some of the most in-demand roles. They all work at Google or IBM to fucking begin with, and they're not going to come work for you. So why are you going to purchase a product like this if you can't staff around it? That's not always the case. You know, some companies think they've got great talent, but like, let's just count the number of PhDs you have on staff, right? That'll, that'll tell you uh, how successful your initiatives are going to be. And that is what feeds this 87% failure rate for ML and AI initiatives. You, you just, one, you got management that wants to ask the wrong questions of the data. Two, you've got very limited staffing options. You really need qualified subject matter experts, and they all work at two companies. So... Um, yeah, this is, this is a major challenge for Databricks moving forward. Um, also not everyone wants to use Spark and Delta, right? Because reasons, right? Like developers are opinionated. They're, they're often wrong and never in doubt, but that doesn't mean that they're going to adopt uh, Spark or Delta if they don't want to use it. But there are also legitimate reasons developers might oppose the use of Spark and Delta. But in Databricks, it's really not I wouldn't say it's optional whether you're using this format. It is deeply embedded into their product that you will use these um, applications like Spark, like Delta, and MLflow. It's the whole platform is built around that. So it's opinionated in that sense, and developers often have uh, opinions that are contrary to that. You know, and but there are very real performance gains with other technologies like Rapids and Dask, and the CPU GPU bottleneck is real. Like. You know, that is the limit, the, time, the, the raw time limit on how much science you can actually do. Um, so they'll have to address that at some point. Um, but their, you know, their paid version of Spark is also really performant, in my opinion. So the future enterprise really has Databricks at the edges, in my opinion. Uh, the big data OS is going to be the centerpiece, and Databricks absolutely plugs into Foundry, right? And so does Snowflake, if you prefer to use that platform, or anything else for that matter. But it is not um, going to enable the future of business, right? It is a tool in that tool chest, like I said before. And, um, you know, to enable the future enterprise, we need to make ML and AI decisions faster, and we need to codify them on the blockchain. And this, if you watched my first video about, about Palantir, this is what I'm describing here, where organizations will use Foundry together as a consortium, and they will codify their business actions in blockchain code 
And the reason you want blockchain in there is to prevent tampering and, and fraud and not hiding where your supply chain comes from. So um, it's my opinion that, that businesses in the future are going to really be using Foundry to make data-driven decision-making and combining it with blockchain to take action on the signal data they capture with those ML and AI models, right? And so to, uh, in my opinion, D Databricks is going to be a tool that sits in this tool chain on top of Foundry. And this will reshape software. Humans will move to the edges of these systems. Right now, humans are at the center, but in the future, we're going to be pushing them to the edges around um, ML and AI software, basically. And I believe that Foundry will be the centerpiece for that modern organization. So we can go from this, <clears throat> right, which is where we're, we're here today, which is decision-making, bottlenecking, and engineering, right? And, and businesses not knowing that they don't want to be in the ML AI software business, be specifically because of this reason, they're bottlenecking themselves. So we can go from this to this, right? We want to go from data to decisions. That's the future of the enterprise. That's the future of business. And that's the future Foundry will enable. But Databricks will be a key component for those companies that can hire and staff uh, scientists to work on domain-specific problems for them. It'll be a tool in the tool chain that sits on top of Foundry. So that's it. That's my take on Databricks. I hope you guys like this video. I hope you got some info out of it. Um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm buying Databricks when it goes public. You know, personally, that's what I'm doing. I really like the company. I just love the team. I love the tech. I could just see so many um, companies that could succeed with Databricks as a tool in their tool chain. And I do believe it's better than Snowflake. And I think it's a hell of a lot better than anything the cloud providers are offering. I love the commitment to the open source community. I love the thriving developer community. I mean, this is just a top-notch tech company, in my opinion. I don't have a clue about their financials. If anyone in the comments section wants to dive into those or put a link to a video for those, by all means, go ahead. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts or reach out to me on Discord. That's it, everyone. I hope you enjoyed.